Good afternoon and welcome to Webinar Wednesday. We're excited to have over 400 registered attendees for today's webinar, which is eligible for one credit from the ACI. Let's get started by giving one lucky attendee a Webinar Wednesday t-shirt for answering this trivia question. Today's sponsor, Flute Biomedical, is headquartered in Washington State. What is the capital of Washington State? Answer now using the questions feature on your dashboard. While you're answering, I want to invite everyone to save the day for 2020 for two of our expos. First, for our ICE Imaging Expo, which takes place at the Hilton Scottsdale Resort in Scottsdale, Arizona, February the 9th to the 11th, which will bring imaging service professionals from across the nation for three days of learning, networking, and the latest advances in imaging. More details can be found at attendice.com. And also for our Spring MD Expo, which will be taking place at the Hotel Irvine, California, from April 20th to 22nd, which will bring together HTM professionals from across the nation. More details can be found at mdexposhow.com. We are also seeking presenters for Irvine, and you can submit your class idea online at mdexposhow.com forward slash call dash call dash four dash presenters dash Irvine and details can be found in the handout section of your dashboard. Uh, the deadline is December the 2nd. Okay and let's see who the winner of our webinar t-shirt is and it is Mike Jenkins. Congratulations Mike. Uh, the answer of course is Olympia. Webinar Wednesday would like to thank our sponsor, Flute Biomedical. Flute Biomedical is the premier global provider of test and measurement equipment and services to the healthcare industry. They serve biomedical engineers, quality assurance technicians, medical physicists, oncologists, radiation safety professionals, and are continually expanding their range of solutions to a broader range of health and safety professionals. Learn more at flutebiomedical.com. Okay, and our presenter today is Jerry Zion, Global Training Manager at Fluke Biomedical. Jerry, you may begin whenever you're ready. Thanks, Linda. Hi, everybody, and thank you for taking time out of your busy day to spend with us uh, on this webinar about defibrillator best practices. Joining me today, and you'll hear, hear him speaking, is uh, one of our subject matter experts, uh, in the in the field uh, using defibrillators uh, er, every day and um, that Justin Ross uh, out of uh, Pennsylvania and so Justin I'm really looking forward uh, to your input um, so uh, those of you that like American football uh, we usually have uh, a, a, uh, a a person that's uh, calling the game and then we have a color uh, somebody that provides a little color or a little bit more interest in the in the thing that's what justin's going to do because uh, he'll add the flavor to what we're going to talk about so justin, thanks jerry yeah okay thank you guys uh, i'm justin ross with rosco solutions i'm the channel partner for fluke biomedical up here in the northeast covering pennsylvania new york city and new jersey so uh, i'm looking forward to helping you guys out today all right great okay so when we talk about defibrillators, is I'm just going to start really with real basics. So some of you have more experience. Bear with us because we also have also a lot of people on the uh, in the session here who are just beginning their their journey and their career path with testing um, defibrillators as medical devices. So in defibrillators, we actually have two major types. We have full ACLS, which is advanced cardiac life support defibrillators. And these allow the doctor or paramedic to select the energy levels uh, and, uh, and be in a little bit more hands-on control of the defibrillator. And then we have AEDs, automatic external defibrillators. And these you will find in all kinds of places, especially at least across the United States and in many parts of the world, You'll find them in libraries and other public buildings, schools. We even have them here at Fluke uh, in our hallways, just in case, so that they're handy should someone have a cardiac arrest. Because there is a limited amount of time before damage happens to the brain and because blood is not flowing during a cardiac arrest. So AEDs are there as a first responder tool 
uh, you don't have to know very much to be able to use them because of their design. We'll talk more about that as we get along. Then we also have, the, especially in the full ACLS defibrillators, we often see pacemakers uh, that are integrated or incorporated into the design of those defibrillators. The purpose for these pacemakers is a temporary external device that can be used to help the heart rate of a patient either be speeded up. So typically, uh, if a patient has a cardiac problem that causes their heartbeat to be slower, we call that bradycardia, then we may want to use a pacemaker in order to speed the heart rate up. There are a lot of reasons for that clinically that we probably won't be able to go into today, but we can go into it at a different time. Uh, just wanna make it clear that we're uh, we're not testing implanted devices. Let me just, oh. okay, there we go. Let me go back one, sorry. We're not testing implanted devices. Um, we, uh, so not implanted defibrillators nor implanted pacemakers, because when we do quality assurance testing, periodic testing on these medical devices, we purposely do not want the patient connected. We're gonna connect our test instruments instead and do everything that needs to be done to verify the performance and safety of these devices. So just to make that really, really clear. So- For some reason, people just don't like us discharging the defibrillators that are implanted in their chest. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. So when we look at the temporary external uh, transcutaneous, Transcutaneous is a big word. It just means through the skin. So we're going to have, we're either gonna pace through the pads or paddles that we would also defibrillate through, or sometimes there is a separate set of uh, little electrodes that stick onto the patient for the purpose of per doing this pacing. Um, the pacer parameters are current that we're going to dial into the pacemaker part of the defibrillator and a pulse rate. Uh, so it will be in pulses per minute. And that will be how we assess um, how much we're, we're uh, causing the heart to beat in addition to uh, the much slower natural heart rate of the patient when we need to do this. There's two different ways of pace. There's a demand mode in which case the pacemaker is going to be sensing the patient's normal heart rate. And as I said, remember, that heart rate is slower than it needs to be for the patient. And it's going to pace only enough to catch up to a more normal heart rate. So if normal heart rate is around 60 or 70 and the patient's heart rate is 40 or lower, we're going to use this demand mode pacer so it only paces the amount it needs to make up the difference. There's also an asynchronous, asynchronous mode of pacing where the pacemaker is just gonna pace at whatever the rate is that you put on it independent. It doesn't care what the patient's heart rate is. It's going to pace at whatever it's set to pace at. And that means that the patient's own heart rate may be there plus whatever you put into the pacemaker in terms of what the actual heart rate is. Just to touch on that a little bit more, on demand pacing, if your heart's beating, you know, if Jerry said that uh, pacer at 60 beats a minute and your heart's beating at 65 beats a minute, there will be no pace pulses. We're not gonna be discharging any energy to it. But in an asynchronous situation, if it's set at 60 beats a minute and your heart's still beating at 100 beats a minute, it's still gonna be pulsing you 60 beats a minute. So you're, you're gonna be catching that shock every time. Right, and for that reason, there's not a lot of asynchronous pacing that really goes on much anymore. Uh, most there, mostly we're doing demand pacing and um, sometimes uh, even in temporary external pacing, sometimes multifocal, which just means that we're pacing more than one chamber of the heart at the same time and in an appropriate way. So if you hear some of these terms, uh, when you're talking to um, the clinicians in your facility, 
that you'll know a little bit more about what they mean. Hey, Jerry, we just had a, uh, we had one of our attendees ping in here and they're asking if there is no B on a patient, patient, how does a pacemaker detect a patient's naturally paced heartbeat? So I think what they're asking is how is it going to detect what the patient's heart rate is to judge if it needs to pace or not? All temporary pacemakers are designed to detect uh, the, um, the lack of a heartbeat. And typically you don't pace asystole, which is a flat line, meaning no heart rate. You don't pace them. What you pace is slow heart rates. So there is a heart rate there. So the reason that, that, is, that the pacemaker is designed to not try and pace asystole or flat line is it needs to alarm and call out asystole or flat line because uh, either the patient is dead or we need to do something else besides pacing in order to get the heart to start beating again. These are not just instrument only devices. These are, these go all, are part of a more uh, inclusive therapy or treatment for the patient that includes um, medications that get delivered in order to help the heart, if it's beating too slow, to be a little bit more excited so that the pacer really helps. Or in, in that case, that's what we're gonna do. So you wouldn't normally pace flatline or asystole, that wouldn't normally happen. Okay, so uh, there are two major uh, types of cardiac life support devices, the pacemaker and the defibrillator. And I think I've already talked to you about when we use each. So now we're uh, talking about defibrillators and pacemakers, what they do. And I think I've already kind of covered that also. Um, we, the defibrillator is there to convert ventricular fibrillation or V-fib back to a more normal uh, rhythm, heart rhythm. It won't always come back to normal sinus rhythm, but it will come back to a more normal rhythm that, uh, that will help the patient because V-fib, ventricular fibrillation, the heart is just sitting there quivering. It's really not beating, it's not contracting, it's not moving blood uh, through, through the lungs and out to the tissue. So that's, uh, that's why the patient is going to suffer lack of oxygenation all the way out to the tissue and the brain. And that's why we get the brain damage and, and other detrimental effects all the way to death. So that's what the defibrillator is really there for. Um, it is also there to slow down uh, heart rates that are too fast. So usually get above 120 or 120 or 180 beats per minute. Certainly anything north of that, um, you're, you're going to need to slow that heart rate down because the patient is at risk of going into ventricular fibrillation uh, with with only a little bit of uh, of impetus, so typically that is called synchronized cardioversion, and we it's also not the first thing that we do. Again, it's part of uh, a, a series of medications that the patient would receive, like sodium bicarbonate, to settle the heart tissue down a little bit, slow it down, make it so it's not so excitable. And if we can't get the heart rate slowed down sufficiently with that, then we will use synchronized cardioversion, which is a bit more brute force as a, as a treatment in order to slow that heart rate down. So that's also another uh, use of the defibrillator that is to prevent the patient from going into uh, ventricular fibrillation. Okay, so why is this important and what can go wrong? The important thing is that we find sources of, of uh, prevent, prevent failure of the defibrillator as a life, life support device before the failure happens in clinical use. So that means we really have to go and test them. 
there are all kinds of things that can go wrong. Defibrillator batteries may not be fully charged or they, there may be some fault in the charging circuitry and therefore not be able to deliver enough energy. Defibrillator charging circuits may have faulty components um, that, uh, that prevent the proper assessment of the patient and the proper charging of the defibrillator. So it's important to ensure that we catch those things early and while they're easy to repair. Um, so there are lots of clinical peer review articles about this, about these um, uh, adverse events that could happen. And we'll talk a little bit more about those as we go along here. So um, that, that's the important thing is the defibrillator just has to work first time and every time when you need to, uh, to use it. On that, you know, we think about where these are located, and we talked about, Jerry mentioned earlier about some of the locations of AEDs and defibrillators. We also need to talk about the fact that these things are carried around in the back of ambulances, stuck in helicopters, in the back of police cars and fire trucks. They're beat up, used. Uh, if anyone's ever been on an emergency medical scene, they'll see the stretcher come out of the back of the ambulance with the, with the defib on the top of it. And as soon as they go over the bank and down to the patient, it rolls off the top of the cart and down the hill and into the mud. Even in the hospital, we talk about them, they sit in a hallway on top of a crash cart and they sit there nice and pretty until they're needed, in which case they're grabbing it and running down the hallway. How often have they forgot to unplug the cord when they took off and headed down the hallway and it's yanked off the top of the cart? So these defibrillators and AEDs have a rough and tough life. You know, some of them, like when they're in those vehicles, it's cold at night and this vehicle's outside in the cold, so they're getting frozen at night. And then in the daytime, in the middle of the summer, they're getting cooked sitting in the trunk of that police vehicle. So there, there's a lot more factors that need to be thought about and the ways that they can be broken other than just in the normal clinical usage of sitting there on the crash cart in case there's an emergency. And to Justin's point, when we look at the US FDA adverse events reports, adverse events meaning failures during clinical use, there are more than 72,000 AED medical device incident reports since 2005, just in the United States alone. So when we think about around the world, how many failures, there's, there's even more than that, at least another 50% more, at least. And so why do we need to do testing on these defibrillators? Well, these are exactly the reasons. Our purpose in our job is to try and prevent these failures during clinical use. And to Justin's point, they are, uh, they are the kind of a device that gets beat up a lot just in the normal use of them and moving from to the point where, where we can get to the patient. It's on, not all smooth hallways and stuff like it, just inside the hospital. So uh, you can, have a look for yourself, not only about defibrillators, but other medical devices right on the US FDA website. Um, it's available for anybody to go and look at and check on. In fact, um, we went and checked just for 2019, this year in the United States about defibrillators. And there were three incidents this year during 2019 in the United States that were reported that we found. Two of those were AEDs. So, uh, it's it's really, really important that we do our job and do enough testing. The manufacturers of AEDs have, from the very beginning, tried to make them able to test themselves. So there's a lot of self internal self-test that they do, uh, even while they're just sitting there. Nevertheless, you can see 72,000 incidents indicate that we need to do more testing more frequently in order to knock that number down. That's unacceptable, just for your information. Here are some other reasons to test. The US FDA and ministries of health around the world uh, are looking at these same statistics and incident reports. Um, there are international standards for minimum performance and safety of medical devices, including defibrillators and AEDs that um, that where they have to be proven safe and effective for clinical use. And in, those are written for the manufacturer of the devices and where that, how that rolls down to the biomedical technician or engineer is through the manufacturer's specifications and the service manual 
uh, test procedure, and that's brand and model specific. So Zoll has theirs, uh, Stryker now used to be physio control has theirs, uh, cardiac science has theirs and on and on. Um, so the, when we're doing testing as biomedical engineers and technicians, we need to be following the manufacturer's service manual procedure in that test, not our own made up one, the one that the manufacturer has created using the requirements in the standards and adjusting them to match their design of their brand and model of defibrillator. And that's how we get the right testing where we're all doing the same kind of testing on the device and with, predict with the predictable results and results that match up to the manufacturer's um, specified pass and fail criteria. So who's going to watchdog all of this in hospitals and so forth? Well, accreditation agencies uh, around the world. So who does that include? Joint Commission, Joint Commission International outside the United States, DNV, which is also international, and HFAP, which is the, um, which is the uh, Healthcare Facilities Accreditation Program um, that, that, that is going to audit how we, that we are doing the testing on these medical devices and more. Um, so it, it's important to you. Let me give you one more reason why. This, in the United States, the CMS, which is the part of the US government that regulates whether and how much the hospital will be reimbursed for cost of care for Medicare patients. And then that rolls down to the, each of the states in the United States to Medicaid patients has some requirements also. And they look to these accreditation agencies to uh, verify that the testing has been properly done. And there's where the requirement uh, for following the manufacturer's service manual procedure is a requirement, absolute. You cannot avoid it, you should be doing it. Now they also have accepted for those hospitals that have database and have uh, analyzed their failure rates to perhaps modify the frequency of inspection a little bit, but not about defibrillators or anything else that is falls under the critical medical device category. Now that's, certainly includes life support devices and it includes life saving devices like defibrillators and more. So if you think in your hospital that you can adjust down and just do once per year or once every two years looking at your defibrillator, guess again, the, that's not meeting the requirement. And then there's the medical legal side of things, which means if we're not doing what we're supposed to do and, uh, a patient is injured or a patient dies, then we're going to court. And even if they settle outside of court on that incident, it will cost the hospital millions of dollars. And that, where does that money come from? It comes out of your paycheck or it prevents the ability for you to get one more helper in your biomed department to help you keep up with the testing that you need to do. So this has big implications not only for patient risk, but also for, for you in your pocketbook. So here's our first testing poll question, um, and I'm gonna read it off. Uh, Linda, do you, do you wanna weigh in on this one where they should respond? Um, it will pop up on the screen, so attendees just pick the option that is relevant for you, and I will give Jerry the results in a moment. Okay, so the question is, how many times a year do you currently test your defibrillators? And we'll just ask that as a general question. And so here's your options. Once a year, twice a year, or three times or more per year. One more. Okay. Okay, right, I'm gonna close out or the poll. Do not, yeah. yeah, there's one more, do not currently test. Okay. I'm sorry, I already gave away the answer. 
<laughs> okay, so I've now closed it. So we have 35% at once a year, 56% at twice a year, 6% at three or more times a year, and 2% that don't currently test. Wow. Okay, two percenters, that's a problem. <laughs> and uh, the once, so here's the real deal. It's twice per year is the, is the best answer for this question. Now, to be sure, there are a couple of medical device of defibrillator manufacturers that have set their frequency of inspection at once per year. But I'm sure you'll agree, when we looked at that 72,000 incidents since 2005, uh, once per year is not enough. And so typically twice per year is pretty good. And it's about this twice per year is what we would look at for other kinds of life support devices and critical devices in the hospital. So we're sticking with the recommendation of twice per year. So if you answer twice per year, that's great. If you did three or more, wonderful. I'm not sure you're actually doing three or more per year, but that's okay. You're kind of, you're understanding where we're trying to come from up, about our recommendation here. Hey, Jerry. Yeah. We just had a, uh, we had a gentleman uh, ping in here saying that their defibs are tested every day. And uh, I can't help but think, but this is, you're right. You know, in most medical facilities, they do a daily check in all your crash carts and your, and your defibrillators, but are you really going through all the parameters when they do that? Or are they just powering them on, making sure it powers on and that the battery's full and the pads are still in service? Right, so um, those tests are done for sure, but they're not done by the biomed typically. They're done by nursing or in the case, Justin, of ambulance services and air medevac, they're done mm -hmm. by uh, a, a flight engineer or someone um, on a daily routine. But typically, those would be done by the clinical staff. The twice per year is what the biomed is going to do. Okay. All right. So there is also, as we look at these automatic external defibrillators, and we look at the new, at the newest, say in the last five to five years or so, maybe a little longer. Uh, full advanced cardiac life support defibrillators, we see the ability for them to have a little bit of an output energy guarantee. Now, what do I mean by that? That means that for those defibrillators, well, in any defibrillator, the energy level that they are ch charging up to, whether set by uh, a dial setting uh, by the doctor or the nurse, or whether it's an AED and it automatically uh, has it already has a set a setting that it's supposed to deliver. What that setting may be, that value should be what's delivered to the patient at the paddles or the pads. And in order to keep up with the change in the the pop uh, percent of the population that is obese, and oh by the way, a lot of other uh, conditions, conduct, conduction path conditions that can occur. So dry skin, or the patient is real sweaty, or there's a, the patient is real hairy. It's got a lot of hair uh, that normally if they were in an ICU or, or any other monitoring situation, they would have that uh, chest hair kind of shaved off for where the electrode's gonna go. You don't have time for that in, uh, in, a, uh, in an emergency situation where the patient is in cardiac arrest. And Justin, you had, when we talked earlier, you had some examples of that, right? Well, I'm a 245 pound hairy woolly mammoth myself. So I can pretty much guarantee you the impedance across my chest is gonna be much higher than a smaller person who uses moisturizer on a daily basis. And uh, in, in talking with my wife and some of my medic friends recently, they advised me like, hey, you know how we actually prep somebody in an emergency situation and i had to stop and think about it. i'm like oh yeah you're right you stick the pad on the person and then you rip it off and bring the, any hair with it and then put a new pad on them and we use that one so oh, we didn't God. really <laughs> have the time to skin prep the patient so right. yeah 
So it's, it's important because there, as, as you can see on the slide, there are lots of different reasons why the patient's uh, resistance to the energy setting is, is gonna be a problem. And so um, the newer defibrillators have built into them a sensing circuit that's part of the charging circuit of the defibrillator that's measuring uh, the impedance, the transthoracic or across the chest impedance of the patient sensed through the paddles or these pads that are, that are placed on them. And then it's given the, uh, uh, it, it's able to adjust itself slightly within some limits so that what you set is what you get. And that's what I mean by output energy guarantee. But you, in order to test whether that functionality is working properly, you have to have more than just the standard 50 ohm test load that's required, uh, uh, has been required in, and built into defibrillator analyzers for many, many, many years. So what do you do about that? Well, we need to have some sort of, the, uh, of ability to provide additional um, resistance values or load values above and below that 50 ohms. Because the obesity, the average obesity of the patients in across the world today is really more like 70 ohms, not 50. So uh, we, we just need to be able to do that. And so you can't test these functionalities with just that one single 50 ohm load. So what do we do? Well, um, across the available defibrillator analyzers today, including ours, there are external loads that can be used so that when you're testing the defibrillator, you're able to also test this functionality by keeping the uh, output energy setting at a particular setting and then testing it across more than one of those load values. So you can see that what you end up with is what we call a flat response. So if I have uh, uh, 200 joules of energy dialed into the defibrillator or that it is set to deliver, that at 50 ohms, it gives me what I expect, 200 joules. But if I, if I have the load at 20, it also gives me um, uh, 200 joules. If I have the load at 100, it also gives me uh, uh, 200 joules. So you can see the that tells us that the, the defibrillator output energy guarantee is properly functioning. Why? Because a lower load or a bigger load, it still delivers the value that I need it to deliver. You cannot see that if you only have a 50 ohm load. You'll never be able to see and challenge that functionality. So um, we say there's typically three different situations where you need to be able to do this testing. Some manufacturers require that you do this testing as part of their service manual procedure, but you should do this testing as part of your acceptance or incoming inspection test for any new defibrillator that's coming into your building before it goes into clinical use. Trust, but verify. You need to see for yourself that this functionality is working properly. Uh, it may have been tested at the factory by the manufacturer you bought it from, but you need to see it for yourself. Objective, independent evidence that this functionality is working. How about after repair? So sometimes if you're not doing the repair in house, it's going out and coming back in. So that's another instance of the acceptance test. But if you just did a repair, even if all you replaced was the battery, you need to retest, uh, and again, I'm not talking about AED so much, but I'm really very much talking about full ACLS defibrillators. If you replace the battery or the capacitor or any part of the charging circuit, you need to repeat the test, these tests to ensure that that functionality of the output energy guarantee is really still there, that you didn't interrupt it, that you didn't do something to prevent it from working properly. Okay, so we've already talked about this. Uh, I don't need to talk about it a lot more. Oh, the third situation for the testing would be if the doctor or the nurse 
doesn't feel that the output energy dialed into the defibrillator was fully delivered, they may have a complaint. You're going to go to the clinical unit. You're probably going to have to bring that defibrillator down to the shop to do the testing. Um, and you're going to need to re be able to repeat these tests and show no matter what the load was that the output energy was delivered. You need to know a little bit more about the incident that occurred that they were complaining about. So what I have done is I have asked the doctor or the nurse, okay, give me a little bit better idea about um, what the what I should think the impedance of this patient was. So their body mass. What, what would you say their body mass was? Big, small, kind of what? And that gives me a, a sense of uh, how of where to do my testing. I want to do testing at 50 ohms, but I also want to bracket or test below and above where we think this patient's impedance really was. And then I also want to know how much output energy was dialed in. If it's an AED, it's going to be whatever the AED is set to deliver. And sometimes there are three different energy levels and it escalates through. But on the ACLS defibrillators, where the doctor or the nurse is dialing the energy value, we would like to know what was the energy value that you think was not delivered. And we will also bracket that if we can. So we'll test energies above and below and at that value, whatever it was. And the data that we, of the, me the measurements, the data that we collect in, in our testing will be what we use. We may plot that out as a graph so visually it's easy to understand for the doctor or the nurse. And we'll be able to have a different conversation with them. That conversation will go like this. If I didn't find a failure, then I'm going to show my graph to the doctor or nurse and say, okay, well, I tested this very thoroughly. It shows that it's delivering all its values according to the manufacturer's design. Looks good to me, therefore it must have been something else. We're not doctors or nurses, we can't practice medicine but we can call out the technical functionality working or not working. If on the other hand, we did find the failure, then we're gonna have the conversation that says, yes, we found the failure, here's what it was, the root cause that we came up with. We did the repair and we repeated these energy tests and the graph again and say, and we have returned it back to its full functionality. And that's what these extra load uh, accessories give you the ability to do. It's a completely and much more wonderful conversation with the nurse or the doctor. And you know what it's going to do to your, uh, their trust in you as a biomed and in your department? It's going to improve it. And I'm going to tell you that I have experienced myself having been the manager of three different biomed departments in hospitals in my experience. That's exactly what happens when you're able to have those kinds of conversations with the doctor or the nurse. So you can't just sit down in the biomed shop and wait for them to bring failed devices down to you. You need to engage. You need to make sure you're learning enough about physiology and so forth to be able to have those conversations and you have the right test tools to be able to help you get that done. All right, so again, best practices. We talked a lot about uh, the output energy testing. One of the things we didn't talk about is a charge time test that's required in the standard and most every manufacturer that, uh, that I've been looking at uh, has, uh, uh, has also wanted the charge time test to be done. The charge time test is defined as the 15th, that's one five, the 15th maximum energy delivery on battery, not plugged into the wall, on battery. And we run the charge time test on that. If you, uh, for, for other defibrillator analyzers, you may need a stopwatch in order to run that test. And the test is from the moment you push the charge button on the defibrillator until the ready tone sounds, how long did that take? There's a specification in the standard and in the manufacturer's service manual procedure that tells you what that pass-fail criteria is. And so you need to make the measurement and that charge time test is part of what we do. We also do the synchronized cardioversion test and we do a series of output energy tests. Um, 
for routine testing, like every twice a year, um, normally we would just test with a 50 ohm load. And then, as I said, for acceptance testing or post repair or this clinical problem, then we do the, uh, the extra load testing, unless the manufacturer requires those extra loads. But there's more to a defibrillator than just the defibrillator or the pacemaker. The defibrillators today, especially the advanced cardiac life support ones, are including everything that's in a patient monitor today. So that's the ECG, certainly. It's arrhythmia um, uh, at, uh, determinations like shock advisory or AED functionality. There's pulse oximetry, or in the case of uh, uh, emergency services and air medevac, we're now seeing a lot more of the pulsed co-oximetry. That's like Massimo Rainbow. So that's SPCO. And uh, you need special, you need to uh, have a, a, a test instrument capable of producing, being able to do the functional test for that pulsed co-oximeter. You cannot do it with a, a regular uh, oximeter tester. These, uh, these devices are actually measuring the amount of oxygen carried by the hemoglobin in the blood. Unlike pulse oximetry, which is only looking that it has a pulsatile signal uh, in terms of the blood flow, and that it, uh, that, that it sees um, that, that it sees the absorption of the uh, infrared wavelength of light that tells us about how much saturation there is in that hemoglobin. But it can't tell you if there's carbon monoxide sitting in that hemoglobin mo uh, molecule. And carbon monoxide poisoning is one of the big, big problems when we're, uh, when we're talking about uh, ambulance services and fire departments where they're the, not only the victim might have been had smoke inhalation, but also the firefighter him or herself. So having something that's portable, non-invasive, uh, like SPCO2, is uh, um, absolutely wonderful because we can remove the victim from the area where the smoke is, administer oxygen immediately, even before we get them to the hospital. And a lot of times we can clear carbon monoxide poisoning even before they arrive in the emergency room, if we have that capability in the defibrillator, right? So if you're not seeing it yet, you will see it. I promise you, you will. Um, the defibrillator includes cuff blood pressure more and more, invasive blood pressure, at least two invasive blood pressure channels, and a now even end tidal CO2 to measure how much carbon dioxide is there in the exhaled uh, gases uh, so we can assess and determine the blood gas exchange between oxygen and carbon dioxide in the lungs so we get uh, an assessment of gas exchange. Really, really thorough. So we need to be able to test all of that functionality as part of the defibrillator testing. It's not just about energy levels. So if you're only testing energy levels, you're not testing enough. So then we come to the external transcutaneous pacemakers. That functionality needs to be tested. We talked about that a little bit. There are communications that are happening more and more so Wi-Fi, cellular, uh, used to be in the old days, fax, modem, and so forth, where the, fire, the, where the paramedic or, or firefighter is sending patient information to the hospital that he will deliver, he or she will deliver that patient to, so they can be ready ahead of time. And those communications are really, really crucial, so you got to test that functionality also. And printer functionality because we're always, we never make measurements off the display screen of a defibrillator or a patient monitor. We run a strip and we make measurements on the strip chart uh, paper of uh, when we're looking at the uh, arrhythmia of the patient. And the summary reports also are printed out using that printer functionality. And oh, by the way, electrical safety testing. And we have a whole separate webinar about electrical safety testing. And I'll just refer you to the archive either on Technation or also on the Fluke Biomedical website where you can learn a little bit more about electrical safety. So you want to make sure you're doing all of the testing that's required. 
All right, our second poll question. Same deal, you go to the uh, polling and then you're gonna to respond to these options. Once per year, or this is how long, how often do you test your AEDs? Once per year, twice per year, three or more, or you don't test. Okay, I'm going to close the poll, Jerry. So you have 43% once a year, 36% twice a year, 6% three or more, and 14% do not currently test. Okay, and I believe that do not currently test option. Why? Because the manufacturer said, ah, you don't need to test these. But we can see with that 72,000 incidents, we absolutely need to test these. So we say kudos, congratulations to those of you who are actually testing at least once a year of the AEDs. And look, I know there are like, oh my gosh, so many AEDs in the facilities. And hopefully we're getting some independent service organizations that are also um, testing those AEDs that are out in public buildings, because those need to be tested also. And keep in mind though, that when you do AED testing, um, there are several models of AED that when you use the battery, it's done. It, that it's once used once and that's it and you got to replace it. So you are going to have to stock uh, batteries for the different brands and models of AED that you will be doing testing upon because you're going to need to discharge the energy through the, the defibrillator in order to find component level failures and so forth. So just saying uh, twice a year is the answer that we like the best, but if you're doing any additional testing beyond that self-test that the manufacturer builds into them, then I give you a lot of congratulations and credit because you're doing exactly what you ought to be doing in order to reduce that 72,000 incidents per year. We have a question. Um, should replacement batteries be purchased from a DFA manufacturer or may they be purchased from another source? And on that, I'm gonna really tell you, it, my opinion is that comes down to your facility's judgment and if they'll allow that or not. I don't know that we can make a stance on that. Jerry, do you have, do you have an input on that? Well, I would just say if you're gonna use something not uh, from the original manufacturer, that you keep track of your failure rates and keep really, really close a close eye on that because a lot of times a secondary market and aftermarket battery is not the same as the battery that was tested and validated in the process of, especially in the United States, in the process of getting their FDA clearance to market. The, there is no medical device that's sold in the United States that is able to be sold without a US FDA clearance to market. And that clearance includes all of the supplies and accessories that, that are to be used with that medical device. So I know that there's a cost differential here that you're trying to manage for cost of repair and, and cost of ownership. Be sure therefore that you are looking at those failure rates and make sure that you have, uh, that you are sharing that data with purchasing in your hospital so they know what's good and what's not good when they go out there to buy stuff because otherwise they're just going to buy on price price is not the only uh judgment of value or quality in this case okay so here's kind of a the story about aed testing daily checks monthly checks those are things that are done by the clinical staff not by the biomed the detailed tests, which we will say are once or twice a year, are done by the biomed. These are checking output energy delivery, um, the, the uh, shock, uh, what is a shockable rhythm? Is it properly identified? Things like that. The, does it go into the CPR cycle properly? And does it leave the CPR cycle properly once the patient rhythm is converted to a more normal rhythm? Voice prompts and so forth like that, alarms, all of that need to be tested by the biomed. All right, so here are the key takeaways from, from this webinar today. 
Defibrillator testing best practices are a bit different for AEDs compared to full ACLS defibrillators. There's more parameters to test in the full ACLS ones, but there are important things to test for AEDs that are go above and beyond, okay? Um, so AEDs uh, are more, um, uh, are all over the place. And so they really need to be tested. And that's the source, a lot of the source of that 72,000 incidents that we were talking about. Be sure your test instruments are keeping current with the innovations and changes in the medical device. We talked about output energy guarantee. We talked about pulse co-oximetry built into the, to the uh, defibrillator. We talked about pacemaker testing the, that are built into the defibrillator. So keep looking at your test instruments compared to the functionality in these medical devices. Be sure you understand them. Um, go to the service school or the, the that the manufacturer provides for these if you can, um, because you will learn so much and it will make it so much easier for you to identify problems early while they're less expensive and easy to, uh, to fix. And that brings us to our uh, opportunity for Q&A. Uh, to learn more about uh, defibrillator testing, medical device quality assurance testing in general, and more, you can come and visit our Biomedical Advantage Training Center. It does require access, so you just fill in a, a, a web form for us uh, completely, and we will provide you access. It's free. It doesn't cost you anything. It's there for you to use to improve your skill and capability as a biomed professional, a healthcare technology management professional. Please use it. We have over 9,000 registered users and enrolled in at least one course, uh, and they come from all over the world. So that we intend for it to be valuable and useful to you. And we ask you to please tell us if we're missing something or if you disagree with something that we said, or if there's uh, if there's anything else that you want us to know. Okay, Q&A. Hey, Jerry, so we got another question here. Here's a good one, and I, I got my answer for it. We'll see what you have here, buddy. How do you know what the output of an AED should be if there's no specs in the output? I'm sorry, if there's no specs on the output from the manufacturer? So so I ran into this back when I managed my uh, biomed shop years ago, and uh, what we had to do is we, to, for temporary, we went and found out if the AED followed American Heart Association guidelines or um, American Red Cross guidelines. And then if you follow those guidelines, sometimes you can go back and figure out what the discharges should be and what the sequence is. And that's something else to keep in mind when you're doing your testing. If you have an AED or if your defibrillator has an advisory mode or built-in AED, is it following the current guidelines? So is it doing shock, 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 then CPR? or shock CPR, shock CPR, or, or what's it really doing there? So my answer to that was that we went back and found the guidelines and then worked backwards until we could get a hold of someone at the manufacturer for their, for their specs. What do you think, Jerry? I think that's a really good process, Justin. Um, the only other thing you can do is do it by experimentation, which means that you're gonna, you're gonna waste a battery. So make sure you have a spare, different battery than the clinical one and then you just run it through discharge without allowing a conversion. So if you, so what you're gonna do is this, you're gonna send V-fib to the defibrillator through the pads or paddles, and it's gonna call that as a shockable rhythm if it's an AED, it's gonna say stand clear, it's gonna charge up, and then either, uh, so it depends if it's a full AED, it's going to, deliver that energy all by itself. That's why you will got to stand clear. And then uh, you do not allow that uh, rhythm to be converted to uh, a more like normal sinus rhythm. You just let it stay at V-fib. The defibrillator should go into a CPR cycle, coaching CPR cycle. And as Justin said, there are different patterns now as to uh, whether it's going to try another uh, uh, another shock or whether it's going to go right into CPR and then another shock. So 
that part should be disclosed in the operator's manual. Um, then, the, again, we're talking about experimentally how to find out if it's going to charge up, how many different levels is it going to charge. The second time around, it should charge up a little bit more. And then, um, and, and then if it doesn't convert again, it'll go into a CPR cycle or whatever the, rip, the, the, the way that it's designed to do. And then, uh, and then it will charge up perhaps a little bit more and that probably will be the full energy value there. Typically AEDs are, first of all, a biphasic delivery, which means it's going to send current from one paddle to the other, and then it's gonna turn around and send it back again from that paddle back to the original one. So you get a plus and a minus going uh, phase in, in terms of the energy delivery. It allows for a lower energy, maximum energy, to be used in order to convert the patient back to a more normal rhythm. And it works really well. It's been well studied in the, uh, before it was allowed to come to market in the United States and in Western Europe. Um, so uh, that's gonna help you a lot in terms of experimentally coming up with it. But I like Justin's approach also, going back and finding out and ultimately getting the information directly from the manufacturer. I believe it should be in the service manual if it's not in the test procedure part, which it should be, it's gonna be in the other descriptions of the theory of operation. You need that service manual and you need at least the service manual test procedure in order for you to do your job properly. God love the theory of operation. Here, here's another good one. My life pack 12 is still passing my tests twice per year. Is there any reason to upgrade? Um, yeah, there is, but I'm gonna leave that discussion between you and your hospital and now Stryker used to be physio control for the life packs. Um, to talk to them about, uh, about the differences between the life pack 12 and the life pack 15, which is the big brother replacement. It's actually the replacement for life pack 12. Um, I agree if, if uh, uh, capital equipment cost is an issue for your hospital, they're probably gonna say, just keep running that thing until you can't repair it anymore. I've been there, I've done that, I don't like it. It's not the best for the patient because there are new innovations like, for example, the pulse coax symmetry that come into the picture, um, the uh, output energy guarantee that is not built into LIPAC 12, but is built into LIPAC 15. Those are all really great reasons for clinical value and patient risk reduction uh, and better clinical therapy um, delivery to to help the patient get well. Okay, I'm going to jump in there, Jerry, as we've reached our 60 minutes. So the questions um, that have come in for Jerry and Justin that we haven't had time to answer, I will be sending them to them. So they will answer offline. Um, so watch out for their emails. They will get back to you as soon as possible. So thank you, Jerry and Justin, for a great and very informative webinar. And thank you again to today's sponsor, Flute Biomedical. Uh, just a reminder that the post-webinar survey and certificate process is now automated, so the survey link will be included in the follow-up email, which you'll receive in about an hour's time. Once you've completed the survey, you'll be able to download your certificate immediately. Um, if you have any questions, please contact us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. And for more information about our upcoming webinars, please visit our website, webinarwednesday.live. So thank you once again for everybody attending today. Um, hope you enjoy the rest of your day and hope to see you next time. <laughs>